Hello, everybody, and good afternoon or good morning, whatever time of the day it still technically is. Thank you for joining us today um, for this Twitter Spaces. We're doing this one slightly differently because we're doing it in the middle of the afternoon um, and to try and just try something different and see how this works today for people. Um, I'm joined by Kerry, who's my co-host um, today, and hopefully we'll be very soon joined by Neil, um, who's also agreed to to come along. Ah, oh, Neil, I've just seen you pop into the space, so thank you. I'll get you up onto stage very quickly um, so you can join in. I don't know if people who are here are new to Twitter spaces, if they've been in a Twitter space before, but just a quick how-to, how it works, um, what the session looks like. So um, Kerry, Neil and myself are going to be chatting today for about an hour. Um, where the plan is to talk about hospital admissions, hospital stays, answer any questions, um, think through with you about um, you know, dementia, hospitals, how it works, how it doesn't work, what you might want to do to have a successful hospital admission, any tips that we can share. We really want this to be an interactive space. Um, we'd love you to join us, to come up, to ask questions, to to contribute and share your stories. And the way that you can do that, there's a, there's a few ways. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a little heart. Um, if you click on the heart, some emojis will pop up. So you can press any of these emojis as you feel like during the session. Um, if you've got that little heart, the open heart now, can you have a go at clicking on it and waving at us or sending us some kind of emoji just so that we know who's here and who's got that feature on their phone? If you're listening to us on um, a laptop or, um, or a PC device, you, you won't have that feature there, so you won't be able to do that. Fabulous. I can see some people have got that feature. So that's great. It's always really useful um, to do that. Excellent. I can see loads of hands waving it, which is a lovely way to start space. So it's really great to see people able to use that to, to contribute and join in that way. So please do feel free to at any point, um, if you agree with something we're saying and you want to give us a hundred, or so you disagree with something you're saying, we're saying actually there isn't that emoji, so I don't know what you do for that situation. Um, but you know, use those emojis um, throughout the session as you wish. The other thing that you can do is at some point you might want to join in. Um, again, along that list of emojis, you might have one that looks like this which is the hand hold up sign that anybody who's been in Teams meetings or Zoom meetings or any of these things are quite familiar with. So do feel free to pop your hand up if you'd like to speak to us and we, we'll come and, and do it that way and join, join you in on the conversation. The other thing that you can do is where your little mic button is, you can hold that down and request the mic. So at some point, again, if you if there's something we're saying and you think, actually, I really want to get involved in that conversation, please do feel free to pop your mic down, hold that down and come and join us on stage and, and have a conversation with us today. So the other thing I just want to talk to you very quickly about, because it's a useful feature, is at the top of the space, you'll be able to see where it says leave, don't click that button, but you'll see the three little dots. If you click on those three little dots, you've got the option to turn captions on, which will um, translate whatever we're saying so that you can read the the, the text. Um, and I know some people find that is a really helpful feature to follow along and, and join. The other thing you might want to do is next to those three little dots, you'll see the little share thing. Um, that's a way for you to let people know that you're here today, you're involved in this conversation. Um, if there's people who you think are, might be interested in joining in, invite them to come along and join us that way and, and join the space today. So that's the technical stuff. That's how this platform works if you've never used it before. Now it's just up to me to do some introductions. Um, so I'm Vic Lyons. I'm the Senior Consultant Admon at Dementia UK. And um, I've been hosting these spaces now since I think June last year. So something we started doing a while ago to connect with people, to have some conversations and, and just to use this new exciting platform. I'm going to ask Kerry to introduce herself and then we'll come to you, Neil. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Kerry Lyons. I am the um, acute consultant Admiral nurse. So I uh, support people um, as new Admiral nurses within the first six to nine months of their operational practice. Um, and today I'm, I'm here to talk about acute care and, and how to improve practice. Thank you, Vic. 
Thank you so much, Kerry. Um, Neil, are you able to unmute and pop up? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Neil Crowther. Um, in this context, I'm going to talk a little bit about my dad's experience uh, in hospital and the support that Kerry was able to offer to both him and my family. Thank you very much, Neil. Would it be so? Obviously, we're here today to talk about hospitals and how to prevent admissions and um, in patient care through discharge. And and Kerry and Neil, you two know each other. Um, so I'm wondering if um, and perhaps Neil, would you be able to tell us a little bit about how you two, you and Kerry, know each other and how you met? Is that okay to put you on the spot like that? <laughs> yeah, sure, that's fine. So Thank my, my dad, um, uh, David or Dave. Um, had been diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's back in 2014 and, and for the most part led quite a contented life, largely I think down to the support that my mum was able to give to him. Um, he'd had a hospital admission in around about Easter 2019. Um, and that was prior to Kerry actually being uh, at that hospital. And, and frankly, it was a, it was a disaster and um, he experienced delirium and all sorts of things while he was there. And I think it really accelerated his his decline. But the situation was rescued to some degree uh, after that um, until, uh, I think, lockdown hit. And as in common with many uh, people and many families, lockdown had a really harmful effect on, on people with dementia, whether living in the community or living in residential care homes and so on. And he began to have a number of falls and seizures, so was admitted back to hospital um, in, uh, in 2020. And... Because of that earlier experience, we were really, really concerned and, and, and what was going to happen and how well he'd be cared for and treated. Uh, and I made contact with somebody at the hospital and then we were put in touch with, with Kerry. And, and this was, of course, in the midst of a local lockdown. We were not able to be in the hospital. And despite the fact that all sorts of problems then still happened, problems which were still very harmful to my dad's experience in the hospital, Kerry was really a, a lifeline and the kind of qualities that, that she brought and the attitude she brought, the approach she brought uh, is one that I think uh, was, was, was hugely necessary at the time, but also one that if instilled in, in care generally would radically improve uh, people's care. In fact, I was just reflecting this morning in a way is that we talk about people with dementia's experience in hospital. But I actually think people with dementia in hospital, if you'll excuse this analogy, are the kind of canary in the coal mine. Um, their experience is going to be experienced by other people when they experience hospital too. So I would hope that the, the leadership that Admiral Nurses can show can be a, a model for, for others. Yeah. yeah. I finished, sorry, Kerry. Yeah, thank you, Neil. I mean, I think what's really important is to try and think about how we can prevent people from going into hospital because you know, a person living with dementia um, may not always be admitted to a hospital. You know, calling an ambulance and being taken to a &E now doesn't always result in a hospital admission. And, you know, it's not uncommon that following an assessment or initial treatment that, you know, that person may be discharged home with no follow-up treatment or be able to stay at home. Um, and I think what's important to, to note really is that many ambulance services and A&E departments now have access to emergency crisis response teams um, and they can um, at times be able to arrange short-term um, you know, 48 hour to 72 hour health and social care support that will then prevent that person from re remaining in hospital and, and experiencing, um, you know, some, some of, of, of those potential harms um, or an unnecessary protracted stay in hospital um, and may well be able to get them home, you know, and that really does... Um, not in the direction really of the, the right care programme, which is, you know, that the right person has the right care in the right place at the right time. And, you know, I I, I do feel, Neil, and I'm, I'm sure that you're going to agree with me on this, that that wasn't available to you at the time, was it? You know, that um, in an ideal world, you know, you, your dad wouldn't have had to have come into hospital and 
uh, you know, and it was very much at a time of, of social care crisis as well. Um, and and often, you know, the difficulty is who to contact at, at, at the time of crisis to to avoid that crisis admission, um, which which we know it you know is potentially going to have a negative impact. Um, on the person coming into hospital and, and also carer um, and, and family, uh, you know, as a as a wider unit. Um, I, I'm, I'm just going to hand back over to you, Neil, just for a moment to respond to that, because I know that was one of the biggest frustrations um, at the time is about, you know, the fact that, that services aren't always geared up to, to be able to give the right support at the right time. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think it, it, it was more than services. I, I think we have to obviously acknowledge the, the context of, of, of COVID. And, and, and the fact is that I, I know, I observed, really kind of kept my dad's health and well-being together, were being at home with my, my mum, feeling a sense that he could live his life, seeing his friends, doing the things that mattered to him, like going to watch the rugby team and so on. And of course, all that just ended. So the challenge for my mum of supporting my dad became harder. I think he began to see home as a prison. He began to see her as somebody that was constraining him rather than supporting him. It was all very, very hard. And that drove us towards reaching out, as you say, and trying to draw in professional home-based care. And it was it just wasn't up to the task. It really it was just transactional, life and limb care. No real thought to understanding my, my dad. No real flexibility. It just didn't didn't work. Uh, because he was refusing to take the medication he had for seizures, he was experiencing more and more falls. And what I would say, just to echo what you've said, was that the, the real gem in all of this many times was the paramedics who were amazing in their communication skills and their empathy and their judgment usually, which was you, you'd really better not to go to a hospital if this is avoidable. But it was just on this one occasion that it that it wasn't avoidable and he ended up in A&E and the assessment team and... Well, I mean, I've documented the story after this, but it really, in a way, it brought his life to rather an abrupt end, frankly, that, that period in, in hospital. Um, so, yeah, I would counsel people to to, to avoid it, um, but at the same time, needing that kind of professional assessment from paramedics and others as to what the best decision is, because it's a really hard call to make. And it, it worries me that lots of people would avoid going to hospital and then potentially die in pain or other reasons at home so how, well, how you actually make that decision seems crucial I think yeah I mean there's so much in what you've both just shared to to think through there and and I and, and thank you both tremendously for launching us off so well um I think one of the things that I've picked up really loud and clear throughout you when you were talking is about that that the idea that people don't actually have to go into hospital. Now, we know um, that statistics will show us that one in four people in an acute hospital will either have dementia or delirium. So we know that lots of people in hospital are there and they do have dementia and we know that people with dementia are you know they're, they're likely to have other conditions other things that they're living with other comorbidities that mean that they, they at times are going to need a hospital admission um so i'm really interested you know and, and of course what we don't want to do is is not p people not to go into hospital if they need to um because sometimes that's the right place for you to be, um, you know, and, and for that that to be a short mission, uh, as short as possible. So I'm guessing a question I'd like to ask you, Kerry, and you touched on this a bit earlier on, is actually how could you prevent an admission for somebody living with dementia? Um, you know, how could we how could we stop them being admitted? Um, you know, what kind of support is there out there? Um, how do we turn to to try and prevent that admission? Because I'm, I'm picking up loud and clear that whilst there is a lot of people in hospital with dementia, it's not actually inevitable that the person has to go in. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I absolutely um, I'm going to echo everything that, that both Neil and, and you have said, um, Vic. I mean, I think that's probably a two part question, really, that, you know, we know that there continues to be a steady increase in emergency hospital admissions. And, you know, unfortunately, research is showing us that 42 percent of, of those are emergency by nature. So as Neil has spoken about, you know, often due to falls, clinical dehydration and infection, um, and they tend to be the most common uh, reasons. And, and we do know that, you know, patients in hospital, um, 
with a history of dementia. Um, unfortunately, they are often six times more likely to experience an inpatient delirium. So we do also know that preventable social admissions are still, you know, a, a factor for people who are living with dementia. Um, and like you've said, that there, there, there are clear risks associated with admission um, when you have got a, a, a background history of dementia. Um, and I think probably the, the the main prevention is key, really, that, you know, to be able to live well um, as much as you can do with dementia, that has to be positively championed. Um, but as you've rightly said, you know, if admission is necessary, then that has got to be accepted as the right course of clinical action. And, and that enables then, you know, somebody to get the right support at the right time. Um, you know, we do know that when somebody comes into hospitals that, there is an increased likelihood of being discharged to longer term care and you know often that both the person living with dementia and their family can um, experience a negative care experience not always you know and there are some really good um, pockets of, of great hospital practice out there but on the whole you know we, we need to do better because there are gaps you know, in the system. And we do know as well that a period of time in hospital, you know, can result in somebody clinically um, and socially deconditioning um, and have an altered baseline on, on discharge. And then that can affect then, you know, their long-term outcomes. Um, I suppose it's important to say that there are a wide range of professionals that people can reach out to you know, to, to avert crisis and subsequent admission. Um, and that very much depends on your need. Um, I'm aware that there is a huge amount of, of different services out there, but often people don't know who to contact in, a, in that time of crisis. Um, and, and it can be a, a real maze. You know, I support my mum who lives with Alzheimer's disease. I am a consultant abnormal nurse. And, you know, it can be tough for me to navigate navigate support for, for my mum. So, you know, if I'm struggling as a health professional, you know, I, I think, it, you know, it's really important to acknowledge that. Um, I suppose just to name a few people, you know, that there is your, ge your general practitioner for healthcare need. I, I know, you know, amidst current um, landscape around COVID, it can be really difficult to get an appointment. Um, accessing a mental health team for a mental health crisis, um, you know, can, can be helpful or even a wider social care team for respite and emergency support options. Um, there are teams around admission avoidance and and re-enablement um, I think the, the the big thing really is around planning ahead and that becomes really important to know who to turn to um, for what you know can can be really really helpful and it is very much about you know having having those tools available to you in terms of you know in terms of of knowing knowing the numbers knowing what their operational hours are, knowing what level of support that, that they could give you, and knowing what your rights are um, as a carer, um, you know, is really, really important. Um, and, and I think it is really important as well, that especially if you've had a period of inpatient stay, to make sure that that forms part of that discharge plan. So for me, a really good discharge starts early. You're fully included in the process and it's reflected it's very reflective of need, but it also thinks about what you need now and what you're going to need in the future, you know, and being able to preempt the fact that we know dementia is a degenerative condition and at some point you may need additional support, um, who to contact and, and, and when. Um, Vic, do you want to add anything anything to that? Oh, I, I mean, that's so much again. And I think we, we are definitely going to have to have a conversation later on in this space around COVID, um, because that, that's come up both when you were talking, Neil, and, and obviously um, during what you were saying there, Kerry, and the impact that, that COVID has had. And, and I guess the other thing that came up when you were talking is around um, some of those kind of gaps in practice and, you know, kind of differences in practice. And it'd be really interesting to, to you know time allowing to try and unpick some of those but something else that you were saying just then um that that's sort of 
piqued my interest, if you like. And I'd, I'd like to ask you a question here, Neil, as well, um, and, and obviously yourself as well, Kerry, um, is, is around, you know, how do you plan for admission? If some, And I know you don't always have the luxury of being able to plan for admission um, because, you know, sometimes somebody has to go into hospital on, on quickly and you, you know and, and actually that and that that's unavoidable and, and there's no planning because it's it's a knee-jerk reaction because something's happened to that person but how do you if if you did have to or when you had to plan um, for your dad to go into hospital or you know what, what kind of advice would you give around planning for ad- admission um well, actually, in, in every instance where my dad was admitted, it was an emergency admission. There wasn't any planning. Ah, um, OK, that's difficult. Then. Yeah, so yeah. But, but, what about about, yeah, but you... I think there's, there's, there's a kind of broader dimension to this, which is just planning generally for the future, I think is really, really hard and much harder than we acknowledge. I should have sort of said at the beginning that professionally, the issue of dementia and care and social care is an area that I work on. I'm interested in. And um I've been reflecting a lot on the whole psychology of those discussions and how impossibly difficult it was to have discussions about the future because you're asking people to imagine a future that they just don't want to imagine and it's just easier to avoid it. And I think that that also underpins, as well as the kind of often lack of availability of community-based services and things, that also underpins some of it, that people are not really wanting to plan. So I think it, it's something I want to think more about and I'd encourage others to think more about how can you have these conversations in a way that doesn't cause people to to reject them? And the other fact being, of course, that um, those conversations can become more and more difficult to actively involve the person in as the person's dementia progresses as well. Um, and so, you know, while you're busy trying to honour what that person may have wanted at a time earlier where they expressed a particular will, you're now confronted with maybe having to make decisions that feel that they go against that, for example, at like moving into a residential care home. So I think this is a really complex area i haven't got a an answer i would just encourage people to do what kerry has said and at least have the intention to try and have as many of those conversations as you can you know you're you're so on the money with that neil because i think that's the one thing that we don't do enough of do we we don't plan ahead we don't think through uh, 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 we, we might think through but we don't have those conversations and and you kind of said about people that, that kind of people's wishes coming into play which of course they have to but actually often you know you know that somebody would hate to see what's happening or you know a course of care that they're needing to undergo and that that comes into it as well and then you of course get that feeling of guilt and am I doing the right thing and you know and all of those things come into it don't they and I think there is something about if you're you know if you know that somebody has got dementia that they're growing older that they're they've got other perhaps other comorbidities or things they're living with it's actually thinking ahead and thinking Okay, what are the what are the triggers? What might I be looking out for? And and I can certainly remember um, when I had my children, um, we you know we were advised at that point to have our hospital bag ready and you know our yeah. notes ready in the hospital bag and you know a kind of a CD that you might want to take in if you particularly wanted to listen to a certain yeah. type of music and 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 actually having that plan in place. Um, not that it worked in my situation because we we forgot the bag, but that, that was probably the. <laughs> to panic at my own planning but you know there is there is something around if if you know that that might be becoming what you know how are you going to do it you know and even sort of really simple or not simple things like do you take someone's medicine in with you when you're going into hospital have they got things if they've got dentures have they got things to take care of their teeth or you know if they always sleep with a silk pillowcase have they got that going in with them or yeah. whatever it might be um kerry i'm sure you're probably itching to jump in as well so feel free to do so can i just come back quickly yes the, of course the, neil yeah, yeah. I, I think that that's absolutely it. i think you know you can do that preparatory stuff around having a bag ready having the things that that give somebody comfort and um, you know i think the the, the, the I, in the advertising you've done for this event you've quoted from a blog that i wrote about kerry and a distinction i drew between people who, in a practical sense, care for somebody and a sense that somebody is cared about. And what I would encourage everybody to do is to think, how can you ensure that in a hospital environment, the staff are almost going to feel compelled to think about who this person is 
and understand them and, and understand their character. And, you know, the very first thing actually Kerry did was not ask lots of details about my dad's condition. It was to ask about him and who he was and Crom's created biography. So I think it's that. It's almost reinforcing their personhood. So it's not just these practical things. I think you have to think about that. And you can do that when you can be there in hospital. You can do a lot of that at the time. So when my dad was first admitted, we were constantly having to do that. Obviously, in 2020, we couldn't be there. And I think that absence of us and that absence of a sense of who he was played out in how he was actually treated and what happened to him in hospital. And it was only really Kerry, I think, that was fund- not I don't, it may be unfair. I think Kerry was fundamentally pulling back at that all the time. And it was about who he was and, and him as a whole person and trying to shape his care around there. But I think at the point my dad's dentures were lost, which was, you know, we found out later, I think Kerry had gone out of the way to make sure that didn't happen. But something like that, I think, can be seen in a very practical, limited sense, or it can be seen differently, which is my dad then couldn't eat the food that he liked. He was very self-conscious and he couldn't smile and it affected the way he could speak. And something like that can just, I think, collapse somebody's health and well-being. But these are these kind of essences that are about the person that can get lost in in hospital care and other sorts of care. And I think what I would advise everybody to do is think about that. How are you going to reinforce who your your relative or yourself is, if that makes sense? Sorry. Oh, gosh, Neil, you know, so true again. And I think that's that's one of the things I, I promise I'm coming to you in a second, Kerry. It, it's around, you know, in hospital, and I know things have changed. and I, I've not worked in acute hospital for, for quite 20 years now, I think, scaringly. But, you know, there used to be a real sense of, you know, person in bed BC or whatever it was or B5 and you know and their medical conditions were driving a lot of the conversation which of course if someone's acutely unwell that's your priority is to get them fixed and better and you know back on with their life but actually the knowing who the person is and you know what what works for them what helps their care what what makes you able to deliver good quality person-centered care is actually knowing the person you know what's you know what's important to them can i use such and such an intervention in such a way to 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 you know make this this part of this person's journey more palatable and you know better for them is is so important and and you know there is um tools that people might be aware of that you can produce so I, I've I've been a long supporter of the kind of this is me booklets um you know those those kind of booklets that actually can go with somebody to say this is this is the information that's important about me because if we went around the room and put everybody on the stage, <clears throat> excuse me, and asked them what's important, probably nobody would mention a medical condition. They would mention their children, their family, you know, the 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 things that they like or dislike, and and talk about them. And it's it's so important, isn't it? So yeah, just thank you for sharing there, Kerry. I'm going to come to you to, if there's anything to, if you want to add at that point. Yeah, thank you, Vic. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. There's nothing stopping a family member making up their own bag to grab um, and take to hospital in an emergency. And, you know, in an ideal world, you are going to be there. You are going to be included every part of, of, of your loved one's journey. But we know that, you know, we we are in unprecedented times with COVID and, um, and there has been some, you know, some quite extensive restrictions around visiting which can 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 add in so many barriers you know if I, I was to say you know what would be the perfect list to go in a bag like that top of that list is what Neil has said which is what matters most to the person so you know a, a passport or a document that's in there that tells me something about that person that is going to be um that, that's going to give me that vital information of the sense of the person, of their their comforts, of what they like, what they don't like, what makes them feel comfortable and what makes them uncomfortable. And other things to put in that bag, um, most recent medications and a copy of prescription is really important. Um, any documentation that you can send with a person, care plans or records of care, you know, can, can really help 
inform care delivery and inform practice and and make sure that you know the the staff have got you know the right level of baseline understanding of, of somebody's physical health needs and um, most recent reading glasses you know if i can't see then i'm going to become disorientated very quickly and the same if i haven't got a hearing aid and i haven't got batteries for them and um, as neil's rightly said dentures and denture cleaning can you know, because if I, I wear dentures, I wear them all the time, then I'm not going to be able to eat without them. You know, I'm going to need them to maintain hydration and nutrition, which will enable me to keep well and get better. Um, and also as well, it's that, you know, that nod to identity. You know, if I'm used to wearing them, then I'm not going to not want to wear them, you know, and, and that my sense of, of comfort and, and, you know, how, how comfortable um I feel in what can already feel a, a very alien environment. Um, toiletries, things from home. You know, it's really important to think as well. Often people think about nightwear um, when we should be thinking about day clothes as well because that would really help then a demarcation between day and night, which can then really help to reduce the risk of sundowning and can help, you know, in terms of orientation. And the big thing is, you know, correctly fitting good sold footwear is really important, you know, because it will help prevent falls, it will help mobility, it will help to prevent deconditioning, you know, and, and enable me to, to carry on with the level of mobility that I had prior to coming in. Uh, and like, you know, both Vic and, uh, and Neil have already said, you know, comfort objects or items of meaningful occupation from home, things that, you know, are going to help anchor me into my current reality I know I'm gonna I'm gonna go back on to Neil now because we we did do a piece of work didn't we around that around passport completion getting to know me and also the use of photographs as well by the bedside which aided communication but also you know aided um orientation as well and comfort uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think those things were important, especially in our absence. I mean, I, I think the thing that that probably didn't work, sadly, although I think it was it was still quite unique in a hospital, was the use of um, uh, Zoom and and FaceTime. I think, but that was more just. I think that kind of perhaps added to some degree of disorientation, even though it was it was kind of desirable. Um, I do remember we bringing my dad's pajamas in. My dad always wore really nice pajamas. And rather than wearing that kind of orange outfit that makes you look like you're in Guantanamo Bay, he, he kind of had his own pajamas, though they weren't always uh, on him, uh, not in this day, in the previous um, previous day. But as, as Kerry's saying, I think it's that idea of kind of doing whatever you can to kind of anchor somebody back in in the world, which is about place, it's about people, it's about purpose, and it's about having a sense of power, isn't it? Um, uh and, and one thing we've not mentioned, though, I think is really important. I know this is sort of advice to what patients can do, but you can do this in terms of trying to encourage your local hospital and NHS trust and others to do this. But the work that Kerry has since, or was and has since put into kind of training and building awareness across the hospital, um, because I'm a bit uncomfortable sometimes with the idea that these things are inevitable in hospital, because I just don't think they are. And as I said at the beginning, I think some of these practices affect deeply affect other patients. Uh, the stroke ward that my, my dad was on for, for a couple of weeks, you know, there was people being brought in there, had very severe strokes, um, probably quite young. First time they'd maybe been in that situation. And the, the kind of nurses were just talking over and about them and all, all sorts of things like that. So I think there's, there's, there's something you can do as a kind of a good citizen and an advocate for change is to challenge those kind of behaviours uh, sort of more generally. So there's the things that kind of, if you like, anchor your, your family member in the kind of world that they bring in with them, and that's really, really crucial. But there's also the kind of culture and behaviours that are kind of present in the hospital that I think need to be challenged. And it's really hard to do that as, as a patient or as a relative because yeah. you, you are in a very odd power relationship at that time. But if you can, I would. 
Do you know, Neil, you just said something um, that, that, again, uh, throughout this, you keep saying these things, don't you? But the you're right about that power shift, because when you're, and I, I've had family members who've been in hospital themselves living with dementia, and, and, and it's really odd, isn't it? You know, you've got your... You, you lose some of your voice somehow and you know you on one hand you've got this really powerful voice but on another hand you've got this sort of oh yes but they're they you know and I think they're they're, they're they're kind of a worrying nagging or whatever kind of connotations can come your way and I think there's something really important about trying to fix the system before you need it or while you're using it because if you're trying to fix it while you're using it it's more challenging and you I, I completely remember feeling that way when um, I've had three members of my family who've had dementia and in all of their cases I've had to be the the, the person who's kind of dropped in or parachuted in to try and fix things so I think there's definitely something there that I'd like to talk a little bit more about hospital and you, you mentioned it there Neil about that kind of training and you know kind of these initiatives to build awareness and to to, to get staff you know, more aware and obviously where we have admiral nurses supporting the best practice of those staff is something that you would expect an admiral nurse to do. Um, but of course, we don't have admiral nurses working in every single hospital. So I'd like to have a little bit of a, a conversation with you both about actually, you know, what does good patient care living for somebody living with dementia when they go into hospital look like? And what do hospitals need to do? And, and I, I'm thinking of a, a conversation I had recently with somebody who said to me that mum had been admitted to hospital and, um, you know, on her notes, it said Alzheimer's disease all the way through her notes. And one of the first conversations she had around that admission was somebody phoning up to say, well, we, we just noticed mum's a bit confused and we're wondering if she's got dementia. So we're going to start dementia screening. And this person said, well, no, she's got Alzheimer's. And they said, yes, we know that, but we're wondering if she's got dementia too. And you just think, so, so there's clearly some work to be done around that kind of education training awareness raising um, and that's what I'd like to just have a little bit of a conversation on um, but before we launch into that I just would like to extend an invite to anybody listening in today who wants to jump in and join in um, feel free to request the mic and come and join us for a little bit we've only got about half an hour left just under half an hour but you know it'd be really great if anybody does does feel like joining us um, and it, it, you don't have to if you've not got a question but if, if anybody has got a question they'd like to ask um, Ava, Kerry, Neil or myself today please do do so so I think probably if I go to you first Kerry or and around that that question I asked. Yeah, thank you, Vic. I mean, for, for me, yeah, you know, I absolutely think that it's got to come from culture um, in terms of making sure that staff are appropriately trained in dementia care delivery and that that is person-centred. Um, and, and to ensure really that we're, we're really recognising as well, you know, the importance of carers and families as partners in care. Um, and to ensure as well that, you know, there's a real, accurate assessment of of need um, and that care is tailored according to that need um, and then there are there are those things you know that we know are indicators of of good patient care for example you know not multiple inpatient bed moves you know not moving somebody out of hours um, if we don't have to do for you know unless it's infection control grounds or unless it's because of a speciality bed need we've already talked extensively haven't we about the importance of passport completion about understanding uh, somebody who who that person is what matters most to them and it's really important as well to make sure that you know they are central to decision making around the planning around their care delivery and also future planning um also as well to you know to make sure that the diagnosis of dementia is fully acknowledged um, and that all staff are aware of that you know and that there are appropriate you know adaptations made um, around care delivery that is reflective of that in terms of decision making um, and then there are those things that we know that we're, we're doing around you know improving um, 
sort of the 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 hospital environment and um, making sure that you know it is more dementia friendly and um, making sure that there is you know a, an option of, of you know meaningful occupation um, uh, the biggest thing is about making sure that you know somebody with dementia is no different than somebody without dementia you know that a person's human rights are fully acknowledged that you know we're caring for that person in a dignified respectful and um, informed way at, at all time and that you know they are central to to care delivery um, I think it, you know it's really important as well to maybe think about what good care or support looks like and and we know that it you know it's been really challenging amidst COVID times but you know pockets of good practice around around those um you know those em embedded practices around identification of carers inclusion of carers so so you know things like care cards and um, carer passports to ensure that you know a carer can come and support their loved one um at, you know at flexible visiting times and and during meal times if that you know if that needs to be the big thing is around there being a very clear and comprehensive communication plan that's agreed between a person's family and the care staff you know so that that carer goes home and you know it is aware of who they can contact when they can contact them to to discuss any plans or to seek out any vital information that they they might need um and and of course that's underpinned by you know that those um you know those principles of John's campaign um, I think what is very important to acknowledge as well is the fact that you know hospital staff need to recognize the carer may be tired and that they are you know they may need time to self you know they may not want to and, and not have the capacity to be there um, supporting their loved one at all times so it's trying to get that fine balance really um, a, a big thing for me is around the organisation, I suppose, having governance structures in place that supports the continuous care, quality care for people who are living with dementia, you know, for it, it, it not to, you know, for it to be one of those priority areas, because like we've rightly said, you know, we, we are literally talking one in four inpatient beds have got somebody within them with a, 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 a dementia diagnosis. And, you know, as, as Neil has rightly said, you know, it's everybody's business, you know, which is why training is so very, very important in terms of raising awareness around the person, person-centred care delivery. Um, Neil, do you want to add anything to that? Because I'm... Yeah, I, mean, I, I can't sort of add that kind of technical expertise, but I think that the, the things that I think are important are not really about dementia care. I think they're just about good quality care. And I think the bad experiences that people with dementia sometimes have in hospital are, are not are, are sometimes the result of a lack of awareness about dementia. It's interesting, Vic, talking about that, that example. We, 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 you know, the reason we got in touch with you originally, Kerry, was because my mum got a call from A&E in the middle of the afternoon and the doctor said to my mum, she said, oh, your, your husband, um, he, he's looking at me like he knows what I'm saying, but he doesn't seem to understand and he's struggling to speak. You know, he'd been taken into hospital with full awareness among the paramedics that he had Alzheimer's with it written all over his notes. And yet again, there we were having to sort of explain. And that had been our experience in 2019 on a stroke ward when consultants were coming round, it was us that every single time when they began a conversation would need to say, you know, my dad has Alzheimer's and they would have to try and adjust how they were kind of talking. So I think th there's something about that that I think speaks to a wider culture of care that isn't just about Alzheimer's. I just think, or dementia, I think it's people with dementia end up, and the families end up experiencing that and its ill effects more acutely than others. So there's that. I think there's continuity. Um, there's issues of kind of handover of notes, of kind of, uh, the discontinuity of staff is very disorienting, but it's particularly disorienting if you're having to completely continue to update them, that you become the kind of join rather than that happening between the staff. And I think we felt that was happening all the time. That was a kind of continuity, a discontinuity of knowledge and understanding that we'd have to keep reinforcing. Um, and that lack of connection across different bits of the, the hospital. I think communication and listening is absolutely crucial. It should be the that you know should be the basis of good care anyway 
Um, but again, it didn't really feel like people were properly listening to my dad uh, or us. And, and they were kind of superficially listening in ways that could have had really dangerous consequences when they were ignoring um, issues of pain and, and, and discomfort and so on. Um, and where they were, I think, potentially at risk of misattributing things to his dementia and overlooking things that were kind of there that were treatable and that they should have been looking at. And I think there's things in common there with the experience of people with learning disabilities in hospital as well that, that we need to acknowledge. I think fundamentally, the thing I want to say is just it's just something about a culture of being human. And I think we just saw that in very different ways in a hospital. I mean, I've written about this and it's quite upsetting to talk about. But there was a nurse during my dad's last stay in hospital who, um, who was just lovely. And after he died, about 10 minutes after he died, she came in very respectfully, took the medication pump away. But as she did it, she said to him, uh, Dave, I'm just going to move you for a second. And it was just... Sorry. It was like remarkably human. And you contrast that with a nurse in the stroke unit two years earlier who was with, with her colleagues arguing with an earshot of patients and relatives about who it was was going to have to go in and change uh, the pads of people who had sold themselves, men in bed who have had strokes. And it's that difference that you can feel. And I think we need to focus on that. How do you tease those things out? How do you learn them? How do you make sure they're maintained? Because fundamentally, that makes the difference. Sorry about that. Oh, Neil, you know what? You, you've just uh, completely got me going as well. So I, and I couldn't agree with you more. You, you're so right. And and I think there is something somebody said on a, on a different conversation that I was having on Twitter um, quite recently, and they they, they sort of said it's about treating people how you would want to be treated, um, you know, treating people with respect, with dignity. And I know I don't want to bash any colleagues in in any setting ever, but you know, actually, and you're busy, you're rushing, you're there's so much to do, and and I don't think you know anybody ever does anything. It, and I'd like to think people don't intentionally do things in a way that's not treating someone with dignity and respect. But, you know, sometimes that gets missing in all of the rest of the noise that's going on. And and essentially, you know, it's about remembering there's a person, this is a person who's vulnerable, who's got needs and, and, and actually thinking, how would you want someone to treat your parents? Or how would you want someone to treat you if you were in that hospital bed and and there's so much as well about um hospital design that is is, a, is something that I, I occasionally think about and i i went to a hospital um that had just been refurbed um fantastically refurbed millions of pounds spent on this this fitting it out and and the, one of the first things I, I met in this hospital was um a lift shack system and that each lift was operated by an ipad and at this, um, the, you know, and then you got in the lift and you operated which floor you were going to. And I'm not going to say which hospital it was, obviously, but you used another iPad inside the lift to get the lift to move. And all of the lifts went to different floors. And you just thought, this is really confusing. And the, the mayhem and madness that was going on around the bottom of this lift shack while people were trying to get to where they wanted to be and get the iPads to work. And you just think, if you had dementia or if you had a learning disability as you mentioned earlier how would this environment feel um how would you get your way through it and and if that's a barrier even before you've got to anywhere near the nurses or the hospital or the doctor you know and got that that level of support that you need and you're unwell there's so much that we we kind of need to think about in terms of you know the the overall design is it accessible is it going to work for people uh, and also, you know, the, the the kind of remembering that this isn't somebody who's in hospital because they've got a leg ulcer or whatever that needs treatment, or you know, it's it's a person um, for, fundamentally, and and I guess that that is difficult. And and I remember working in an acute ward, and you you know, you're so busy and you're so concerned with the the medical reason that someone is there for that you you know you do sometimes perhaps lose lose track a little bit of the person Can, the, the, I, th I think i think the thing that I, I just can't impress upon everyone more and i think this was fundamentally what kerry's approach an admiral nurse's approach embodies is that i think we we incorrectly separate the kind of medical from the social i think there are countless people in hospital that die or become unwell or don't recover not not because there isn't a focus on their medical condition, but because there isn't a focus on who they are. 
and, and, and unless we change that and get that right, you talk about integration of health and social care and everything else till we're blue in the face. But unless we fundamentally change that, we won't really achieve the results we're talking about. Um, and, and I think that's it. And that, that for me is the difference in Admiral Nursing to some of some, but not all of the other nursing that we, mm-hmm. we saw. Um, so that, that's sorry to keep reinforcing that point. But oh, no, no, really no, no, fundamental. Think, and it yeah. comes back to the practical steps you can take. Be there if you can be there. If you can't be there, reinforce who the person is. And in kind of every interaction with the hospital, reinforce who the person is in whatever ways you, you can. I think, I think that's the key to, to them having a less bad experience, as well as what we said at the beginning about if you can, and it's appropriate, probably avoid being in, in hospital or yeah. uh, in that kind of setting. Well, I think there was something that you said to Kerry earlier on as well, which was about, you know, day clothes and not night clothes and solid shoes, not slippers and, and, and actually about meaningful activity for people. But we know, you know, if, if any of us on the call went into hospital, we would be stuck in one of those horrible gowns and they are horrible, um, you know, very quickly. And, you know, and you, you would be sometimes encouraged to stay in bed. So, you know, what what kind of meaningful activities uh, there for everybody it's not just people with dementia is it? it's you know how is hospital enabling people to get well um and get out and Kerry when you were talking earlier you talked about social admissions as well and sorry I can see you've come off mute so are you ready something to say at this point <laughs> absolutely yeah I, I, I mean I, I'm going to echo everything that, that both yourself and Neil has just said I think what's really important is that yeah, especially when we talk about meaningful occupation, we're we're talking about somebody's normal baseline um, activity, you know, and and you know, I'm a, you know a, a big concern of mine was around you know the constant sitting down of patients. You know, would we do that all day at home? You know, no, and 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 then I'm leaving hospital, and my mobility isn't at the level that it was prior to going in hospital, and then you know now I've developed a, a, a pressure sore or pressure damage, and um and you know I don't feel stimulated, and and from a cognitive point of view that you know I've I've, I've suffered a deterioration um, whilst in hospital. I think the the big thing is around continuity of care, um, isn't it, Neil? You know, it's about the fact that there has to be, you know, those very, very, very early conversations around discharge planning. It should start at the front door. It, it should, you know, include a full and understanding um, of, of what an accurate baseline is and actually, you know, what somebody's ability is and, and what the plan is around um around home you know how a family are coping prior to coming into hospital how the person is coping you know I, and to start to then think about you know what is the least restrictive option on discharge how can we get somebody home in a timely and planned manner how can we include you know those that matter most to the person in involved in all of that decision making we don't want to keep somebody in too long in hospital um, you know, whether they're not able to mobilise, you know, that they're seeing a, 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 a decondition and a reduction in the baseline. Um, it is really, really important that, you know, we, we really do start to think about improving the transitions of care, you know, from 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 admission from pre-admission, maybe, you know, through to every transition within the hospital. Um, through discharge and and it, it be reflective of need and and into into the discharge destination um because that there often feels and i'm aware of time and it and this is probably a twitter space all in it on its own but you know there's a real disconnect between secondary and primary care often and and a breakdown of communication between teams and um i, I suppose for me that that is where you know the apple nurse can can add real value because they they very much walk um, those transitions with the family, with the person living with dementia, to try and make sure that care is really reflective of their need, um, but then not to have to keep somebody in hospital too long. Um, and, and you know, for, for the decision making around discharge planning to be um, be appropriate um, and, and timely um, and, and also that it involves planning for the future and that may be end of life planning it, it may be a recognition of ceiling of care you know it it may be to have those you know like Neil's already said you know it can be 
it can be very tough to have those um, conversations, um, you know, regarding regarding a recognition of, of this is where we're at in terms of the, the level of dementia and, 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 you know, where do we go from here that will enable you to feel empowered with what happens next. I think one of the things that you, you've said there is, is so important as well is actually that the you know people do have to go into hospital and if they do have to and you know and actually how if they're in hospital let's start planning the discharge as soon as possible and thinking about where is this person going to go after you know they've had this intervention that they need to have that's brought them here um, you know how can we get them back to where they want to be ideally or if if that's no longer appropriate let's start thinking through where where's the best place for this person to go next and and actually for those kind of conversations to start having happening at the front door not at the point where someone's you know been moved through a couple of hospital beds and you know so there's so much there we're really running short on time as we always do on these 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 calls but i do want to have a quick conversation about um, covid and we've talked a couple of times throughout the space today about covid and the impact that that it's had on people and and obviously you know nurses um, no nurse anywhere would ever want family members not to be able to come in and visit somebody and family members whilst sometimes somebody going into hospital gives you a little bit of a a breather for a while and initially especially if someone's been very poorly in the run-up to going in people don't want their loved ones in hospital either do they so um you know how any advice or tips that either of you can share neil having lived through this experience or Kerry as a professional, having worked with, um, how, what would we ad- offer ad- around advice about that? Um, it, it, I think it's really, really hard. I mean, we, we were very fortunate that, that we were able to be with my dad, uh, ironically, in palliative care as he died. I never quite, I never quite understood the rationales that were sort of playing out in all of, in all of this and, and and how some of that worked but we were very lucky and i feel blessed when i listen to other people's stories especially in the light of the news over the past few weeks about what's kind of been going on and it's really i think released a lot of people's anger and grief hasn't it about having been disconnected from people and their families as, as they died um but i think it's really i think i think had we been able to be there more beforehand i'm not sure he would have got to that point <laughs> and I think that's the kind of balance isn't it there was so much emphasis understandably on infection control but the I think a lot of people actually declined massively or lost their life as a consequence of, of, of that practice so I mean I'm a big supporter of John's campaign I, th- I think we need to um, be avoiding this in future and looking at kind of limited access to um, to families who are I think absolutely crucial to people's care that's that's my view. I realise I'm not a nurse and I'm not trying to make a hospital safe, so there'll be a complete counter view to that, but I just wanted to express that, that opinion. No, thank you, Neil, and a massive shout out as well to John's campaign and the work, um, because that the that has made such a difference. It's it's kind of revolutionised the the treatment and support and the and the recognition of carers in hospital. Sorry, Kerry, I think I spoke over you there. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with, with that. I mean, I, I was just going to add, really, that, you know, find out what the um, the interim COVID visiting policy is, find out what the restrictions are, um, find out the detail around that. You know, I, I think a big thing is around agreeing a communication plan um, and, and being able to make sure that, that, you know, you can articulate what your needs are um, as carers. as well. It is really difficult because these policies Policies are dictated by infection control directives and the normal locally set. Um, but I think it is really important to have those early conversations with staff to see if there's any flexibility around uh, mitigation connected with that, that policy. And often trusts now do have mitigation around patients who are living with dementia to permit you know either one or two carers to to be named persons to uh, to be able to be permitted uh, for visiting so uh, the big thing really is around having those early conversations 
Thank you very much, Kerry. So we're literally in the last minute, and I always believe these things to try and finish on time and start on time. So I'd like to come to you both for some final thoughts. Obviously, we've had, it always goes quick, can't quite believe it's an hour, and um, we've had a, a long conversation. Um, I guess some of the stuff that I've, I've taken around um, from this myself is that there's, obviously, there's still lots to do in terms of training and awareness, and, and I guess once covid is finally <laughs> out of the way. I don't know what the right terminology is around that. Um, you know, we can start to to kind of get get some of these changes um, in, embedded and made, hopefully. And obviously, quite clearly, more admiral nurses and more carries working in hospitals would be something we would we would advocate and support um, from Dementia UK. Of course, we would. Um, you know, but actually, if it's a loved one, you know, making sure that the admission is planned and that uh, as much as possible, and that you know what what you need to take with you what it's going to look like um and and really crucially start talking about discharge and what next almost as soon as possible so that would be my final thoughts um neil do you want to share yours and then we we'll go to you Kerry. final thoughts yeah just quickly i think i think it's it's true for all of us isn't it that we we we, we thrive when we're in the place we call home and when we're with the people that, that we care about and care for us and when we're able to do things that matter to us so being in hospital it inevitably takes some of that away. And it, so the whole message about if that can be avoided just seems eminently sensible. I just want to say at the same time, though, that we also all have an equal right to health and should expect an equal right of access to the NHS and to be treated well where, when we're in there and adjustments to be made. And I, I really admire the work, as I said, that Kerry has done, not just to support individuals in the hospital, in the community, but to try and bring about that change because that is that's just morally right and we should be pursuing that. Thank you, Neil. Kerry, final thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm just going to say about person-centred care delivery. I, and, and Neil, you said it earlier on, there is a difference to care for and to make a person really feel cared for cared for you know to to feel that care and actually know that you're there to to try and make a difference um and that you're recognizing that that person for the life that they've had and that and that the person that they are so um yeah we, we've got some way to go you know and hopefully we're we're very committed to growing the field of acute abnormal nursing and, and raising awareness around best practice and um, dementia care delivery uh within within acute but you know a lot of this is not overly complicated it's about taking it back to basics a big shout out to that you know it's got to be and what works for somebody you know if they've got dementia if they've got anything that makes the you know will work for everybody you know it's about fixing it that way up isn't it um you know and actually treating people as another message how you would want to be treated you know not be kindness again isn't it it's that that importance of that Thank you both, Kerry and Neil, from absolutely, you know, entirely for your time today to join in on this conversation. I think, as always, we we could talk for ages, um, and it's it's been fantastic having you both join me this afternoon. And thank you, Neil, for sharing so beautifully um, your story and, and so emotionally. Thank, I really, truthfully, thank you for for doing that because it's it's so important that that you you were able to do that, um, especially on this weird platform. So thank you both. Um, it, it's thank you for everybody who's listened as well. I hope you found it interesting. It would be good um, for those who have listened just to have a quick show of emojis, whether that was helpful. Um, wave goodbye. Let us know. Um, also, do drop us some feedback afterwards. It's still something new that we're doing, and we really absolutely value and and want your feedback. Um, if you've also got things you'd like us to talk about in the future, let us know um, what, what, what topics you think we should be talking about and covering. It's great to see some emojis popping up. So thank you, everyone. Everybody. So our next space, we're planning on talking a little bit about what is an admiral nurse. We, we obviously we talk about this this term and um, you know what an admiral nurse is, what we do, how it works, why should somebody become one, why should you employ one, um, and some some of those topics is is certainly the plan um, for what we'll talk about next time. So anybody who's here today more than welcome to come and join us um tell people to come and join us as well it'd be great to to have some conversation going on thank you again everybody for your time today and i apologize i've gone slightly over but that's just because it's such an important topic so thank you and hopefully we will see you again later on bye everybody